I'm very pleased to welcome Michael Ashby. Um, Michael's now retired, but before he retired, he was senior lecturer in um, the Department of Speech, Hearing and Phonetic Sciences at University College London, um, teaching phonetics, including a very successful summer course in that subject, which I once taught on myself, so I can say how uh, it's very thorough the, the teaching method that they used there was. Um, Michael has research interests in all sorts of things, phonetic, phonetic theory, the prosody of English, the phonetics of Korean, um, and in particular perhaps the, the um, English as a, a foreign language domain. Um, he's worked very extensively in lexicography for that. Um, a particular application. He was the phonetics editor, maybe still is. Are you still the phonetics editor of the Oxford Advanced Learners Dictionary, which is the, lar the world's largest selling dictionary for learners of English? And uh, among other things, he's published on um, phonetic science generally. This introductory textbook is really excellent. I can thoroughly endorse this, <coughs> at least because it has really excellent illustrations. I really like the pictures, and it's very, very nicely done. So I can recommend that one if you're looking for an introductory text on the subject. Um, he's worked a lot on the history of phonetics. Um, UCL has a very long um, involvement in the teaching and uh, research of phonetics as an independent branch of linguistics. And um, in our many discussions uh, in my capacity as uh, external examiner for the MA programme in phonetics at UCL, Michael's told me of many interesting aspects of the links of UCL with universities around the world, notably with Japan, which is a place that, that Michael travels to pretty regularly, three times this year, he told me, already. Um, UCL has long had strengths in the development of multimedia learning and teaching technologies. There's a lot of really excellent software you can download from the, the UCL website. I strongly recommend you go and have a look there um, to find all manner of useful tools. Michael, in fact, was responsible for developing the first ever uh, e-learning um, distance course in phonetics called Fonline, now several years ago. Um, but it came as no surprise when I heard that he had won a Provost's Teaching Award last year um, for his uh, contribution to the teaching of the subject, not just at UCL, but um, further afield. Um, quotes from the, the webpage about this award say of him, that he's passionate about designing diagrams and embedding them in his teaching materials. Uh, he's a byword for excellence and innovation in the teaching of phonetics, and he's radically changed how phonetics teaching is delivered. So accolades in, indeed. Um, this evening he'll be talking, um, not in a prospective way, as we've been hearing, we've learned about the state of the art as it is now and future prospects, but uh, this evening we'll be hearing about some retrospective uh, looks back into the past um, about advances that took place in the 19th and early 20th centuries. So without any more preamble, I'll hand over to Michael. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you also for the invitation to come here. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the organisers. In fact, it's a year ago that the first plans reached me about this, so I've been looking forward to it for a year. And I'd like to congratulate you also on uh, what has been a very well organised and I think successful conference. So thank you very much indeed. Just a uh, hundred years ago, vowels were a bit of a mystery. Whole treatises were published with titles like The Vowel. The Vowel. These, these are not books on the vowels of any particular language. They're about the abstract concept of vowel, how to describe vowels, how to analyze them. I don't think anyone has ever written a book called The Consonant, so there's a great opportunity for you there. There was a, there was a lovely book published recently called Turbulent Sounds, which I thought is a wonderful a wonderful idea for a themed collection. It's the nearest thing to the consonant so far. 
But it's different now, isn't it? Because vowels are, if anything, thought of as rather simple examples of speech sounds. When we learn acoustic phonetics, we begin by learning about vowels. Nobody starts studying the acoustics of nasals or plosive bursts or something. These are very difficult things <clears throat> to model. And I don't want to steal any of Mark's thunder for tomorrow, but here is an example of uh, one of Mark's wonderful programs, this program E section, which enables you to do all sorts of wonderful things, <clears throat> look at waveforms, extract spectra, and so on. This is actually Daniel Jones. E, 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 A, A, O, O, U. So we can take a bit of this here, zoom in, have a look at the waveform, have a look at the filter response, and so on. So we're used to these various graphic representations, and there are others too, <clears throat> like the vocal tract outline, which can be associated with the production of the vowel, or the various plots of collections of vowels, ensembles of vowels, that uh, we have seen examples of this afternoon. All of this seems familiar. But the fact is that none of this was achieved easily. There is a long story behind the attempt to get all of these graphical things out of speech. I'm going to take some of these representations. <clears throat> I can't give you a history of each one, of course, but what I hope to do is show you something surprising or new from the background of each one. Since I've become interested in historiography, I have become convinced that linguistic science, and science generally, is carried on in an entirely ahistorical way. This is because scientists like to present what they're working on now as an improvement, an advance on what was done previously. It's been arrived at by the refinement of models and hypotheses, and so it, it's an improvement, it is better, it fits the facts better than what had gone before. If you adopt that view of science, which I don't as a matter of fact, but if you adopt that view of science, then you're forced into a selective view of the past. Because you can only be interested in those things which somehow lead to what you're doing now. And all the other stuff that scientists did in the past must be more or less irrelevant. <clears throat> so... The, the background to these representations is not just a question of where did the current ones come from, but what other things were tried, what other competing representations did previous speech scientists, linguistic scientists, have to cope with. I'm going to start first with the waveform. Now, we're used to seeing vowel waveforms like this. Any graduate student, if you say sketch a vowel waveform, they'll draw something like this with its periodicity determined by vocal fold vibration and an internal structure reflecting the resonances of the vocal tract. But actually, it is very hard, it has been very hard, to see this waveform. When I first went to UCL in the late 1960s, we didn't have any way of plotting a speech waveform, uh, at least none that could be afforded for any practical purposes. You could get UV paper coming out of an oscillograph at several miles an hour, uh, but then you had to find somebody to pay for the photographic materials and so on. And we were discouraged from dealing with waveforms, I think, for this, for this reason. I don't know who can be credited with the first waveform. There's some background to be determined there. But just have a look at this. This is a web page from an island in the Pacific called Belau, now, or Belau. And I'm particularly interested in this artwork here. You see this woman there, she's talking, and look what's coming out of her mouth. Looks awfully like a waveform that she's launching into space. And some other people here are talking or singing, and they have waveforms associated with them as well, or oscillations. I, I'm not the first person to discover this. It was, it was noticed by a, a hundred years ago by a German anthropologist called Krämer. This is one of his photographs from back then. And these people also seem to be producing oscillations. I don't know how to account for this. I fear a, a trip to the Pacific may be required. And, uh, when the opportunity arises, I shall, I shall uh, rise to the occasion and steel myself to it. But 
But a hundred years ago, when, when Kramer was publishing these, most phonetics labs couldn't produce a waveform. The, the nearest thing they had was a chymogram. Chymogram. Here's, here's a chymogram published by Daniel Jones of the word potato being segmented for you. This top trace is obtained from a mouth uh, a mouthpiece. The bottom trace is a timing trace from a 100 hertz tuning fork. And it's not purely the acoustic waveform. There's some pressure and flow information in this as well because it's <clears throat> the, the, the transducer the speaking tube. But this is the nearest thing you've got to a waveform. And it, it doesn't really look anything like the proper speech waveform. Um, this is what a chymograph looks like. This is a, a relatively modern one preserved in Osaka. There's the works. These are the timbres which draw on the smoked paper. These are the input devices. This is the mouthpiece connected by a rubber tube to the timbres. This is for the larynx. This is for the nose. And this just gives you some idea of scale. It's quite a large instrument, this one, in Japan. Uh, this is what it looked like in the manufacturer's catalogue in the 1920s. You bought a huge table with the chymograph on it, and then it came with all these wonderful and expensive uh, accessories for smoking the paper and doing various other things. The, uh, oh yes, here's Japan's first uh, phonetics lab. This is the same model we saw in the previous slide. It's one of those, but now shipped to Japan and installed in Osaka. And here's the prominent thing, the big smoked drum with all the waves written on it. And that's the thing you tend to uh, focus on as being characteristic. But of course, that doesn't really matter. What really matters are the transducers here. This is what's doing the work. And the timbres are basically pens operated by air pressure. You've got a pivoted uh, lever here, which generally ended in this, a point made of celluloid. And it's actuated by movements of a rubber membrane, which is stretched across a bell here. This is, this is from the Palmer Manufacturer's Catalogue. This is a real example, a beautiful one preserved in Oxford. And you can still see the piece of cord around here that tied the rubber membrane on. You speak into the speaking tube, the membrane wobbles to and fro, and the pen scratches a white line on the paper. Unsurprisingly, such a device is not a very high fidelity device from the audio point of view. In fact, uh, this is some work recently done by Rudiger Hoffmann and colleagues measuring the frequency response of such a device. And you see it's marked by a whole succession of major low frequency resonances. The first one is actually at 20 hertz. And then there's another at 150 and so on. So, when this device responded at all, it was probably just luck that the fundamental frequency of the, uh, of the speaker happened to sit on one of those resonances, because these are 10 dB divisions, notice. So it's a huge difference between the response at resonance and away from resonance. There were alternatives. The electromagnetic oscillograph, moving coil and moving iron devices were devised about a century ago, a little more than a century ago. This is one, <clears throat> the Duddle oscillograph, a huge machine manufactured by Cambridge Instruments. The, the oscillograph is in here. There's a powerful magnetic field, a coil, actually just two turns of wire, which is being twisted around. And then there's optical and photographic apparatus for recording a spot of light, which is being swung around under the influence of the driving current. Of course, even if you had an oscillograph, you've only solved about 20% of your problem. Because you've got to get the speech into the oscillograph somehow, then you've got to take a permanent record from it, and then, if you want to do anything quantitative, you have to analyze, measure the record that's come out. Here's a lab in Tokyo in 1931. This bench with all these boxes, this is the oscillograph. So this basically accepts a current and outputs a piece of photographic paper with a line drawn on it. This is the microphone and amplifier. He also had his own x-ray equipment, but uh, the microphone and the amplifier, we take these things for granted. 
when you, you, you buy an electorate microphone for a pound with an amazing frequency response and easy to use, before World War II, if you wanted a precision microphone, you had to build it. You had to have a machine shop to turn it out for you. And then you needed a lab that was at the cutting edge of electronic technology to build an amplifier good enough to drive the oscillograph, which needed about a tenth of an amp to twist the coils around. So it's, it's a very high uh, current for a, a tube amplifier to deliver. The eventual answer was, of course, to be the cathode ray oscillograph. And the first tubes, the first high vacuum cathode ray tubes, were devised about 1931, marketed about 1931, and oscillographs began to be available from then. Though, even when they came along, you were looking at a tube about two inches in diameter uh, on which a trace was being drawn, and the power unit, the amplifiers, the time-base equipment, all of this was right at the cutting edge of tube technology and kept going wrong. I recently found in a box at UCL a little cardboard box containing a number of tiny black curls. Little, little curls. They turned out to be curls of 16 millimeter film. And when unraveled, they're 16 millimeter film with waveforms on them, evidently from a photographic device. And to cut a long story short, I think what I have found probably is material from uh, Robert Curry, who was active in the 1930s. He as far as I know, was the first person to succeed in making satisfactory photographs from a cathode ray oscillograph. Not still pictures of one uh, image on the end of a tube, but running speech. He had his film on a drum that was rotating, uh, and there was a clever arrangement of solenoids and shutters so that the film was exposed only for one rotation of the drum. The speaker said something into the oscillograph. It was written on the film. You develop the film, and then you unroll it and you've got uh, a waveform. And what happened here was he got Daniel Jones <coughs> to travel up to Newcastle and record all of these waveforms for him. I think this is entirely forgotten work. Why was he in Newcastle? He was working on the survey of English dialects with Harold Orton. And their plan was that they would record reference waveforms like these and use them to make a uh, an instrumental or a supported analysis of the waveforms they were collecting from the other uh, dialects of Northern England. You can see that they're relatively successful. Last year, Mark and I had a go at turning one of these back into sound. If you scan it, you can then turn the resulting image file back into sound, and it does, it sounds like a little burst of eh, eh, which is exactly what you'd expect for cardinal vowel number three. But, you can see he was having focus trouble. Uh, the the um, image, the, the, the line is quite broad in some places. That's to do just with the voltage on the tube and the extent to which he was able to make the point small. So, we've got probably the first cardinal vowel waveforms captured by cathode ray oscillograph. He published this work in the Second International Congress of Phonetic Sciences, 1935, which took place at UCL, so much happened at that Congress. It's full of all sorts of amazing advances, uh, 1935. Not much is known about Robert Curry. I've managed to discover he was born in Durham in 1910. I know his mother was a school teacher and so on. He disappears from the radar about 1940. Uh, I believe he emigrated to the United States and may have worked at Bell Labs for a time. What happened after that, I don't know. He published a book called The Mechanism of the Human Voice, which was published in 1940, just the wrong time to publish a book, uh, and it eventually received an extremely favorable review from Daniel Jones, of all people, even though it more or less dismisses articulatory phonetics as a, an approximate attempt to do something when you haven't got proper instruments. Um, and it's not very complimentary about the phoneme theory, which was Jones's obsession. Nevertheless, Jones was big enough to say, it's a, it's a wonderful book, let's hope for more 
from Robert Curry. I'm going to move on from waveforms to the mid-sagittal section, the outline of the vocal tract, showing the disposition of the articulators. It's very hard to come by good examples of this. If you've written a book or an encyclopedia article or something, <coughs> you will know how difficult it is to get a good picture of a mid-sagittal section, which you are allowed to use, uh, and which is clear enough to show what you want. I've published this picture in a couple of places. <clears throat> it actually shows my daughter at age 12. So unlike the normal adult male, this is an adolescent female. And the reason I got it is that she was just beginning orthodontic treatment. And in those days, <laughs> orthodontic treatment began with a full-size x-ray. And I was paying the orthodontist enough money, and I persuaded him to give me the film, <laughs> and then scanned it and did with it what I wanted. But, of course, uh, you're left with just whatever you can get out of this image by Photoshop. Uh, it, it's not designed to show the articulators, but rather to show the teeth. Nobody has written a history of the mid-sagittal section as a photograph or a diagram, I believe. So one thing we very much need is a survey of progress in understanding where these diagrams came from, who borrowed them from whom, what the ultimate source of the data was. Have you seen this before? I was consulted about this uh, recently in connection with the, the exhibition which is on in London. This is Leonardo. He was probably the first to sketch a mid-sagittal section. And the, the exciting thing about it is he's got the velum more or less right. It looks like a flap that's capable of dividing the airways in, in, in the appropriate way. Um, there, there are all kinds of weird ideas about what the soft palate was and did before this. It's a very thin-looking velum, that's one problem. He probably had some difficulties in sectioning ahead. I've no idea how you'd do it in, in 1510. It's probably a challenge for anatomy even now. And interestingly, it looks as if he was sketching out phonotactic possibilities here. This is an exciting collocation of a diagram. This is his mirror writing, obviously. Sorry, I'm, I'm pointing to the right-hand screen because it has better color and contrast. Um, it, his mirror writing, so, uh, you know, uh, fa, fa, fi, fo, fo, fu, and so on, as if he's working out all the combinations. We, we can be skeptical about this because actually he probably spoke a variety of Italian that had seven vowels, and he's only got five here, so at least he wasn't a brilliant phonetician. He didn't discover that there should be seven vowels and invent two symbols for them. But, uh, of course, this was lost. Like most of his work, it's, it, it wasn't known until the late 19th century when these notebooks and dra drawings came to light. I recently found some beautiful glass lantern slides. You know, before 35 millimeter slides, we had Lantern slides, big pieces of glass with film on, three or four inches square. <clears throat> and uh, in a box, everything you find is in a box. In a box, I found 89 of these lantern slides, and they're absolutely beautiful. They are drawn perfectly. They're evidently photographic reproductions from superb drawings which have an excellent underlying source. Here's a close-up of one. This is ka. So and you notice all the detail on the hyoid, the enumeration of the vertebra. Everything is perfect on these pictures. So each one is, has been separately sourced from high-quality x-rays. It isn't an outline that's had tongue shapes drawn on it. Each one actually has been derived from a proper source of data. But with the slides was no documentation, no identification, nothing. Didn't know who'd made them, or when, or for what purpose. I had a suspicion, straight away, that they must be work 
by this man, Tsutomu Chiba. Now, I don't know if you've heard of Chiba. He's uh, certainly one of the most um, notable phoneticians in Japan. He was a UCL alumnus in the early days. He studied at UCL. And he went on to found the second phonetics laboratory in Japan. His was in Tokyo. And he's noted for x-ray work. And I couldn't fail to notice that my slides had a lot of visual resemblance to slides that he'd published. Look at the hyoid, look at the vertebra, the placing of the symbol in the bottom left-hand corner, and so on. But the slides didn't seem to be from any published work of Chiba. Search for all his publications, they're not there. This led to an exciting uh, time in Japan, looking for the source of these slides. And eventually, uh, in Sofia University in Tokyo, in a wooden box, they have, <laughs> in a box, they have some Chiba treasures. Little things, notes, books, and so on. And in the box was a paper bag from a liquor store. And in the liquor store were some curled up photographs. And these are what they are. It turns out that the photographs are prints from the same negatives that we used to make my slides. And that proves conclusively that Chiba really must have been the, uh, the one who produced this data. So the, the process would have been <coughs> x-rays, because he had his own x-ray lab. The x-rays were traced manually. And the x-rays would be life-size at this stage. They would then be photographed, you make photographic copies, resulting in negatives, the negatives are lost. And from those negatives, our glass slides were printed, and at the same time, the prints found at Sofia were made. We know it must be this way round, because often there are several prints of one original. So if, if, the, um, if the slides had been made from the prints, it wouldn't be this way. These prints are obviously just reserve copies of the negatives prepared at that stage. So it's very interesting. In order to understand the development of these things, we also need to know something about the graphic and photographic processes of the past. It's very, very hard indeed to find, if you were publishing a book in 1920, exactly what steps would be involved in putting an illustration on the page. Who would do it? What techniques were employed? What intermediate stages would the diagram go through? What about outlines of cardinal vowels? Everyone's seen these pictures. These are from uh, Daniel Jones's outline of English phonetics. In all its editions, he went on printing the same frontispiece from the very beginning of his career, which, I don't know what it does really, it, it's just to show uh, that he once did some x-rays, because <laughs> it, <laughs> it, it doesn't really support the cardinal vowel theory very strongly. Jones knew perfectly well, right from the start, that the cardinal vowel system would not stand up to scientific scrutiny. This was a big disappointment. And uh, that's why he didn't really publish extensively on it. He knew that if you, if you made lots of x-rays and measured them, unfortunately, it didn't confirm his ideas about how vowels were made. So this is why he used the technique, really just as a practical technique. A big problem with early x-rays was uh, obtaining sufficient contrast. It didn't have a good contrast enhancing agents to paint on the tongue. Metal chains were tried. In, the, in these pictures, uh, a chain of lead plates was laid on the tongue. And these dots, you can see, which outline the tongue, these are the the obviously the opaque uh, plates of the lead chain placed on the speaker's tongue. He wasn't the only person to do this. His colleague Stephen Jones um, published a, a, a brief paper called Radi Radiography and Pronunciation 1929. And he had <clears throat> a refinement, I don't know if you can see on these pictures, but instead of uh, articulated lead plates, he had a fine silver chain weighted at one end, he laid this on the center of his tongue and the weight 
was meant to settle in the gap by his epiglottis. Then he put another chain through his nose that was resting on the floor of the nasal cavity and dangling down over the back of the velum. And they were both weighted. And in this way, you can obtain both the tongue outline and a reference point. Now, there's a lot to know about Stephen Jones, and I can't uh, go into that very much. But th these measurements have obtained a certain degree of currency because uh, in all the editions of Peter Ladifogid's course in phonetics, he put some measurements that he obtained from the Stephen Jones pictures. And uh, Stephen Jones doesn't seem to have quantified the pictures and come to the obvious conclusions, or he knew the conclusions, but he just didn't say them. Uh, Peter Ladifogid worked it all out here and said, look, the front vowels are more or less arranged as they're supposed to be, but the back vowels are all over the place. Highest point of the tongue is just wrong here. O and O are more or less the same, and so on. But Peter Ladifogid didn't know <laughs> that Chiba had done it before. <laughs> in 1931, <laughs> Chiba had published this book, uh, which is certainly hard to find in any Western library, um, research into the characteristic of five Japanese vowels and the eight cardinal vowels. And the, the information for the cardinal vowels he took from the publication of Stephen Jones, and he remeasured them. But he did it rather better than Peter Ladifogid. He began by enlarging the images photographically, devised a grid system which is all defined accurately in the paper, and then he's able to plot the vowel. Uh, at the tongue outlines for the various vowels and find the highest point of the tongue. It's more or less the same picture as Peter Ladifogid obtained, but not quite the same. Uh, more or less the same. But if I have to choose, I think I prefer this one in terms of completeness and accuracy. The 1931 measurements are rather better than the 1975 ones. And I've no idea how Peter did it, because he doesn't say. The original pictures are tiny, so there's a, probably a lot of just measurement error anyway in getting the, uh, the measurements off those photographs. As I say, there's a lot more to know about Stephen Jones, but again, in a box, I recently found this, which is, <laughs> it's a piece of the silver chain used to make Stephen Jones's x-rays. And actually, by, by weighing it, you can work out that the weight per unit length is exactly the same as the chain he specifies in his paper. Wait, I haven't got a weight. I think this is a spare bit after the chains used in the experiment had been cut. And uh, that looked just like a speck of dirt in the bottom of the box. He, he imagined an incredibly fine silver chain rolled up in a tarnished ball. Oh, unroll it, and that's what it is. It must be Stephen Jones's vowel chain. Of course, uh, these are all still pictures. Still pictures. And I, I hope to show you some bits of film, too, because uh, I, one of the things I've been doing is restoring and digitizing old film that I've located. Um, the Second International Congress of Phonetic Science is 1935. If you read any reports of that Congress written by those who attended, for example, Jacobson attended and he wrote a memoir about it, uh, Firth attended and he wrote a memoir, and there's one thing that everybody mentions in their account of this Congress. It's not a paper, it's not a presentation, not a great theory. It's three minutes and five seconds of film, which was exhibited by Paul Menzelat from Bonn. And, well in a box, <laughs> I have found a length of 16 millimeter sound film, which, after restoration, turns out to be, probably, the actual print shown at the 1935 Congress. And maybe I can make this work. Der Röntgen Tonfilm nimmt gleichzeitig Ton- und Bewegungsvorgänge im Körperinnern auf. Besonderes Interesse verdient vor allem die Wiedergabe der Sprache. Man erkennt dabei Form- und Lageveränderungen des Zungenrückens und, Grundes, und Zungengrundes, des weichen Gaumens, 
des Kehldeckels und Kehlkopfes. Auch Töne und Bewegungen des gesunden und kranken Herzens sind für die Aufnahme geeignet. It, it caused a sensation in the film because people knew that speech would be like that. Uh, people had done thought experiments. I think de Saussure's got somewhere where he imagined what it would be like to look at a slow motion film of speech activity. But that's not the same as actually seeing it. And uh, they were plainly gobsmacked because <laughs> it, it, there was no trace of the segments, the pieces that they uh, had spent all their lives describing and teaching and symbolizing. It was just this fluid motion everything happening in this complex, coordinated way, and they were completely blown away by the film. Um, there's one other copy of that film. There is a copy in Berlin, in an archive in Berlin, but the, I have to say, the catalog entry in Berlin is wrong, and they don't credit uh, Menzerat. Only the radi radiologist uh, Janke is credited, so eventually that has to be put right. The next thing I want to consider, really, is the vowel space. Vowels arranged in space. We've had a lot of papers today about vowel, uh, uh, vowel accommodation, vowel formant measurements, and so on. And generally speaking, we work with a two-dimensional space, don't we? Um, now, The International Phonetic Alphabet is two-dimensional, two-dimensional display of consonants, or three-dimensional if you count voicing, which is represented by different symbols. And here's the vowel space down here. This is essentially the cardinal vowel system, but turned into a part of the IPA chart. Um, I'm actually on the executive council of the IPA, so I ought to defend it. But I have to say, it, it doesn't have to be like this. <laughs> uh, there's nothing that, that validates this. It's just what has happened as a result of practice over years and years. I rather suspect that we have a two-dimensional display because pieces of paper are two-dimensional. And when you start writing something down, oh, you have two dimensions. Uh, or three, if you count the ink, or whatever you're going to do with uh, presence versus absence of material. So there is nothing given uh, about this. It's just, it's, it's just established through long usage. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, if you look back at earlier systems of vowel description, they have baffling numbers of dimensions. Uh, sweet, for instance, as far as I can figure out, Sweet, Henry Sweet, eventually had a, a system of vowel description which had five dimensions. Only some of them are intelligible to us now. The others are ones that we can't quite pin down. I did at one point convince myself I understood it, and now I've forgotten again <laughs> just what it was. But one of the dimensions is narrow and wide. And then there's another one to do with the, the local slope of the tongue contour. The thing is, though, that Sweet was, wasn't a fool. And if he thought he could make and control vowels in five dimensions and hear them in five dimensions, maybe he could. Uh, uh, and uh, Bell and Ellis, who uh, adopted similar systems, they, they were extraordinary phoneticians, probably better than any phoneticians with any of us met, and they worked with this kind of system. Trouble is, there's no diagram. I mean, a, a table like this doesn't help you visualize what the five dimensions would be like. They're not even necessarily five completely orthogonal dimensions, but th there are five. Of course, this is all simplified after Daniel Jones comes up with the cardinal vowel system. It wasn't the first one, but the one which has stuck. <clears throat> it's actually 20 years ago or more now since I published a, a paper showing that actually even, even the formula for drawing the cardinal vowel diagram doesn't work. Uh, the, if you look at what Jones says about 
how you should draw the diagram. He says that the quadrilateral has sides in the proportion 2, 3, 4. Okay. And then the rest is a fairly simple geometrical construction. When you measure the examples of quadrilaterals from his book, you find they don't match that at all. They've actually been done by a ruler and compass, a ruler and, uh, a compass and straight edge construction, in which this is an angle of 60 degrees, and then the rest can be done with compasses. And it, the, the wonderful thing is that one of these patterns came into use in Edinburgh, and the other one continued in use in London. So the two uh, groups of phoneticians thought they were exchanging ideas with great precision about cardinal vowels, and in fact there was a 17% difference in the size of the vowel space they had. David Abercrombie, when I showed this to David Abercrombie, he was very worried. <laughs> uh, of course, the, uh, what it means is it, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, far greater travesties of the vowel quadrilateral have been printed, some very, very tall ones, very long ones, uh, some in which the, the divisions are unequal, and just, just ask a bunch of people how to construct the central triangle in a cardinal vowel uh, diagram, and you'll get a, a whole lot of impossible geometrical formulae for how to do it. Um, so the precise shape and proportions plainly don't really matter. We're able to move graphically from one to another one somehow that's sufficiently similar. And there have been, of course, uh, other approaches to this. Um, I don't know, Ian Catford in 1977 published this one. In fact, I remember him coming to UCL and talking about it, in which uh, you've got this, this chunk of a circle, the vowels arranged around a center here at R, uh, at R and then these lines, the, the, the high vowels are up here, then the, the back vowels, the low vowels down here. The interesting thing is that um, R, R, cardinal 5, which in Jones's terminology is an open vowel, and now becomes a close vowel. Okay, it, is, it is close if you think about the pharynx, because the tongue is very close to the rear wall of the pharynx. The pharynx is highly constricted, so it's close. But if you focus on the oral cavity, then it's open. Um, so the question is, which, which one should you, uh, should you opt for? Actually, if you, if you follow the instructions Daniel Jones gives for learning how to make the cardinal vowels, he seems to imply that cardinal five, that is R, must be close. Because as, if you take it any further down and back, you will produce a fricative. Therefore, it must be on the friction limit, and the fricative you produce would be, in, in modern terms, a pharyngeal fricative. Ah, 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 this kind of thing. And, well, people got quite interested in this picture of Catford's. But I wonder, I do wonder, whether in the back of his mind he might have had a recollection of something he'd seen 40-odd years earlier as a student, when, as a fellow student, there was a Korean called Kim Sung Ki, who did his thesis, a dissertation on the phonetics of Korean under the supervision of Daniel Jones. And it's not published in, uh, in England or in English, but the, the uh, dissertation can still be examined in Senate House. You go along and have a look at it. And it has got the most extraordinary vowel space in it. This. this is uh, Gim Sung Gi's elliptical vowel space of 1937, in which the card it, it, it still represents the cardinal vowels, but they're arranged around the periphery of an ellipse. And there is now only one kind of centralization, which is radial centralization. And you can have these other these other uh, lines running around which represent degrees of centralization. This must have had Daniel Jones's approval because Jones was the supervisor and examiner for the dissertation. Firth was also a supervisor of the dissertation. So this is a, an interesting example of Jones and Firth doing something together. If, if you 
trust David Abercrombie's account, they hated each other so much they wouldn't pass the time of day, but they evidently did quite a lot of things in collaboration. And uh, this guy, Gim, not only devises this interesting elliptical space, but he makes use of it in describing the phonology of Korean. He says there is a long-term vocal effect, which he calls... Um, which, which he calls um, a kind of voice that you use to put somebody down, on poo-poo somebody. Um, and this is achieved by moving all the vowels radially towards the center of the ellipse. So a single, a single description tells you how to move all the vowels. And you end up with a shrunk version of the same vowel space. We need to know a lot more about him First of all, how was a Korean studying in London in 1937? Uh, since Korea was under Japanese control, uh, it would have been impossible. <laughs> how, having got to London, did he study Korean, since it was prohibited to study Korean? Uh, in fact, when he returned to Korea, he was imprisoned uh, for a year. Uh, he then survived the Second World War and the Korean War, and went on to become, become the deputy education minister in the Korean government. So, <laughs> quite a survivor and uh, somebody with some remarkable achievements to his name. But I think that there's another sort of lesson here about uh, adopting a, a rather Eurocentric uh, approach to historiography. If, if we don't look at what was done in Japan or what was done in Korea, then we're missing something. It's almost, it almost seems to me sometimes as if science hasn't really been validated until it's been replicated in the West. <laughs> you know, you can, it's only part of the proper tradition when somebody at MIT or Bell Labs has checked it just to make sure it's right, and then they publish it. Um, Chiba and Kajiyama actually worked out the acoustic theory of speech production and published it in 1942. Fifteen odd years before anything in the West. But why, why aren't they credited <laughs> with doing this? Why, why do we still say it's Stevens and Fant and Flanagan and the rest of them who worked it all out? And this leads me to, if I may, some more sort of philosophical thoughts about images. I think there's been an underlying assumption all day that graphics, images, uh, exist to communicate information. That is, I, I assume, uh, what's in the back of everyone's mind when they sit down to draw a graph or make a figure. But uh, scientific communications, whether papers, pictures and so on, have other purposes. At least they do if you take a kind of sociological view of science, as I tend towards. And another purpose they have, actually, is to bolster your prestige, to impress people. Because being a scientist is not just a matter of, it's not just a matter of getting your facts straight and coming up with good theories. You've got to live in a real world. You have to get grants. You have to keep a job. You have to get things published. You need a network of associates and so on. And this doesn't come automatically from being right about something. You do this by building up prestige and impressing people. And I, I do wonder to what extent uh, images are published to communicate purely, and to what extent they, they may be unnecessarily flashy or carrying badges of, of authenticity and, and, and importance. Now, this is just a simple example. This is from Phil Rose's book on forensic phonetics, an excellent book. And there's nothing wrong with this display. It's, it's a tableau of six spectrograms. But it's evidently a piece of artwork. The six spectrograms didn't arrange themselves on this picture. They've been pasted together, and the, there's a, a frame around them and so on. So it's been photoshopped, or something has happened to it. But in the process of photoshopping it, all this other clutter has been left on. See, why, why have the time on here to the nearest, what, 100 microseconds? Surely that's just to impress people. Oh, I, I, 
Yeah, I'm cool. I can measure time to 100 microseconds. It must be good, you see. Um, so maybe you don't agree. But I think there is an element of doing something with an image to make it seem authentic or persuade people to believe in it. Uh, indeed, if, if these scales had been uh, cut off and replaced with beautiful ones done in Photoshop or something, you'd feel perhaps the image had been tampered with in some way. And there's a very interesting thing about chymographs too. The chymograph worked by scratching lines on sooted paper, so the resulting image was white lines on a black background. Now the normal way to draw something is to put black lines on a white background. Isn't it? If you draw a graph, you don't begin <laughs> by blacking nearly all of the graph and leaving a white line. And the chymogram had to be reproduced photographically. So as soon as you photograph this, it goes negative and you get black lines on a white background. So why, why not publish that? Why did they go to the trouble of printing the images so that the tone values are retained? It's because they want it to look like a real chymogram. Everyone knows a chymogram is made on blackened paper, therefore the image must look like a chymogram. Again, the truth is, if you've ever seen this done or tried to do it, this lovely uniform black at the back is only obtained after lots of retouching on the negatives because the process of sooting the paper is messy and produces streaks and blotches and patches and it's only, it's only after you've carefully scratched away every bit on the negative that you can get this beautiful black and white appearance. So again, I, I think that there was more going on there than merely reproducing something. Now I'm going to finish by showing another clip of film and I've shown it before, I showed it at ICPHS last year, but I don't apologize because it's the best clip of film I've discovered in recent years and it actually involves the word potato. Um, Potato is, is a good example to use if you want to show things like VOT, voiceless plosives, hold phases, aspiration, and so on. In the short clip of film I'm, I'm going to finish with, this, this comes from 1928, as far as I can determine. It was 35 millimeter nitrate film that turned up in the understairs cupboard of 21 Gordon Square when we moved out in 2008. And it was in a, a rusty tin at the back of a shelf in the cupboard. We only just discovered it before locking the building for the last time. And as far as I can work out, it had been there for 80 years. Because the edge markings on the film show that it was manufactured in 1928. And it shows the operation of a chymograph being used, a chymograph being used to make a chymogram with the word potato. And it's interesting from that point of view because, as far as I know, it's the only film anywhere showing a phonetic chymograph in operation. But what I also want you to think about looking at the film is, has it been made just to communicate information, or is there something else going on? Do you agree with me that the, the piece of film is deliberately made to look dramatic? Look at the lighting, look at the framing of the shots, Look at the way the experimenter never reveals his face. He's always behind the chymograph mask. It's meant to look futuristic and impressive. Look at the shadows. <laughs> You notice the dissolve it wasn't a jump cut, it was actually a dissolved in the camera. See, art film. <laughs> this is Stephen Jones speaking into the mouthpiece. And that's all we see of him. So, uh, I, I think that there's more going on in that clip of film than just showing the operation of the chymograph. It doesn't show you how to assemble the timbers, it doesn't show you how to smoke the papers, it doesn't show you how to set the machine up, it shows this thing in dramatic operation. I think that's the 1928 version of those clips you get on TV documentaries where people are wheeled into MRI scanners and so on, and it's meant to look really impressive. Uh, 
And so I think that remembering that uh, images may have purposes other than communicating information may be uh, a message I'd like to leave you with. And there's one other thing, if I may. Uh, I just wanted to thank all the other presenters today for their papers. But if I can appoint myself spokesman for those people in the population with a certain disability that is not usually taken very seriously, uh, I'd like to remind you that 10% of the male population has defective color vision. And colored graphs mean absolutely nothing <laughs> to me. So green and yellow and blue marks on a, yeah, I can see it's all in different colors, but I haven't a chance of finding the right part on, on the graph. So uh, when you're designing your graphic software, please think about the color schemes, at least consider the most common types of uh, defective color vision. And how about a mouse over that names the color? Put the mouse over something and it says red or green. That would be a godsend to me. Okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs>